Acts chapter number 2. And uh, I'm going to preach tonight about the church in Acts, A-C-T-S, the church in Acts. And uh, the Korean church where we, uh, we sold Calvary Baptist to the Korean church back in 2007 when we moved in here. And uh, they had been using the building. And the name of their church is the Church in Acts. So a lot of times we'll talk about the Church in Acts. We'll talk about the New Testament church. And uh, there, there's some fundamental truths about this New Testament church that, that we want to have in our church. Uh, but this is a different church. Uh, in the beginning of the book of Acts, it's a very different church than what we know today. So let's just pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, the privilege to preach the word of God. And I thank you for faithful people come out on a Thursday night and want to hear and know and believe and live the word of God. Lord, thank you for how good you are to us, Lord. I think back of just this past week and the summit and how it thrilled me and it was just a great time. And uh, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for our church, God. I'm thankful that we have a, a Bible-believing church. I thank you we have the, the property we have. I thank you for the people we have. I thank you for the freedom we have. And uh, Lord, I thank you that we have a sound mind and we can learn and uh, just love the Word of God and love you with all our heart. Pray help me now as I preach and I pray help people as they listen and we learn something. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let me just talk about the church in Acts. Uh, and I already mentioned, it's, it's, it, there's some things that are very much, we're, we're very much like they are in a lot of ways, and that's what I'm going to preach on tonight. But in a lot of ways, there's a difference. So when we come into Acts chapter number 2, and it's very shortly here, either the day of Pentecost or very shortly after the day of Pentecost, remember some things. Number one, it's still totally Jewish. It's a Jewish church. Everybody in it is either a Jew or a Jewish, Jewish proselyte. At this time, they don't even understand, they don't even know that the Gentiles are going to be having the Holy Spirit just like they do. That doesn't happen until Acts chapter number 10. And uh, when it does happen, they're, they're really upset with Peter and they have a big church council and pretty much bring him on the carpet because this is totally unexpected to them. So... Even though they've had the Great Commission, Matthew 28, going to all the world, preach the gospel every creature, they're still all in Jerusalem. They surely don't have any missions fund or any missions program or any missionaries. So it's, a, it's, it's an exclu exclusive club here. They're still going to the temple. They don't have a, a building like we do. They're still going to the temple. And they're still observing all the Jewish religion. They haven't, they haven't left it. They haven't separated. There's still signs and wonders going on. There's still miraculous, unexplainable, outside of God events that are happening. So they don't have a local church. So they don't have pastors. They don't have deacons. But they still have the apostles. The apostolic age lasts until John, which is approximately 100 A.D., and we would call that the apostolic age. So the, the apostles are still there. They're still in Jerusalem. They're still Jewish. They're still expecting the kingdom to come. They, they, they have no idea at all. They're, they're a church, but they don't know it, if that makes any sense to you. In other words, God begins that church on the day of Pentecost when people were baptized in the body of Christ, but they don't realize that. They don't understand that. The mystery of the one body is not given until Paul. And in Paul's epistles, we'll, he talks about the mysteries. Uh, something was hidden in the, in, in, before that. And uh, so they're still observing the law. They're still keeping the law. If you remember Peter in Acts chapter number 10 when the Lord sends that vision uh, about eating the unclean things, he still at that point is refusing those unclean things. He's not going to eat them. Uh, that, that would be a sin for him to eat those, those unclean animals that came down on that sheet. 
So even though uh, we have a lot in common with this church, we have a lot of things that are different about the church today and the church back then. So with all that said, let's look at Acts chapter number 2 and verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, all right, to understand completely. And again here, Peter is talking to Israel as a nation corporately. Know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So this is Peter's main message. The man Jesus, the one that you crucified, is not just the man Jesus, but he's the Christ. He's the Messiah, and uh, he's Lord, which means he's, he's God, he's deity. And uh, this was an unbelievable, I couldn't say it's unbelievable because they believed it, but this, this was quite a revelation to these people. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? They didn't say, what should we do to be saved? But they said, what are we going to do? We've got this man's blood on our hands. So let me just say this. In verse 37, they believe Peter's message. They're pricked in their heart and they want to know what to do. They, they, they believe that Jesus is the Christ. In verse 38, and we talked about this for a couple of weeks. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. You want to know what to do? This is what you do. You repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins, and you, receive, you should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is exactly what John the Baptist had preached, uh, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, I had, uh, we had a man visit us at the 8 o'clock service this past Sunday, and uh, he's in a, um, a church of Christ pastor. He grew up in Texas. He's a native Texan and he's pastor in a, a church of Christ. Church of Christ, this is their main, main verse. They believe in baptismal regeneration. They believe that you have to be baptized in water if you're going to be saved. That is not, that is not New Testament uh, 2022 uh, doctrine. You don't get you, you go to hell if you believe that because water baptism doesn't save anybody, all right? Uh, for the promise is unto you and to your children. Now, if you remember in Acts chapter 16, uh, the Philippian jailer, Paul said uh, to be saved and to be baptized. And uh, his, his house, they all got saved, they all got baptized, but they were old enough to understand. There's a lot of people take verse 39 to use this as Bible basis for christening babies. I guess they call it baptizing. When I got as sprinkled as a baby, I was christened. But this is not a verse that teaches uh, to baptize children. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourself from this untoward, meaning a crooked generation. Then they, were, then they, that, gla then they that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done, notice, by the apostles. Many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. Not everybody did wonders. Not everybody did miracles. Uh, these miracles were the signs of of an apostle to validate a person was an apostle. Let me read you something out of 2 Corinthians 12. Paul says, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. I am become a fool in glorying. You've compelled me, for I ought to have been uh, commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. So Paul here is defending his apostleship. And he says, I'm not second fiddle to anybody. He says, truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Everybody was not doing miracles. A lot of churches today uh, are into, you know, the miracle center and 
And uh, you got your Benny Hens of this world and all that's going on. I'm not saying God can't do a miracle. I'm not saying God can't heal people. But I'm saying what was happening in this uh, Pentecostal church is not happening today. So verse 44, and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And uh, they were very liberal. They were very giving people. They continuing daily with one accord in the temple. They're still going to the temple and they're going every day. I mean, there's a lot of people can't make Sunday night. There's a a lot of churches today doing away with prayer meeting, doing away with Sunday night because people don't want to come. So they, they figure, you know, we'll just, we'll just give up. We'll give it up. And uh, so they're coming to the church every day. And breaking bread, that's not communion there. It's talking about eating, fellowship. They went from house to house. They did eat their meat, which is a word for food, with gladness and singleness of heart. They were of one accord. They were one mind. They were one heart. They were on the same page. They were on the same channel. That's the way a church is supposed to be. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily. The Lord, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. So God's got to do it. Whatever the ministry is, God has to do it. So God was, uh, the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. So I want to look at these verses that we're reading here. And I have a, just a pretty simple outline. But there's things that we're reading about here, about this church 2,000 years ago, that a church ought to have today. It still ought to be just as, as essential as it was back then. And our church, these things that I'm talking about tonight, we need to have in our church, and I believe we do have them, but I believe we could do, always do a better job. Good, better, best. Now, that's, let's never rest till our good is better and our better is best. So notice number one in verse 42, the Bible says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers, in prayers. We've heard a lot of preaching recently about prayer. And uh, we just had our summit last week. Most of you are pretty uh, familiar with the summit. I had preachers call me and say, this, this is the best one ever. Well, some of those preachers called me and said the same thing last year. So everyone seems to be the best one ever. But Brother Charlie mentioned this on Sunday. I could feel the prayers this year. I could feel the prayers. I just knew people were praying, and I think it showed in the services. I think it showed in the singing. I think it showed in everything we were doing. But the Bible says here, that they were steadfast in their prayers. Over in Acts 16, we won't go there, but they went out to the river where the ladies were gathered, where prayer was wont to be known. And that word W-O-N-T means to know. There was a place there where they knew people prayed. And this church, we as a church, we need to know that we are praying people and not just to show off, but people ought to know that we're a praying church. Amen. You know, it's not, just, it's not just about in a church. It's not just about size. It's not just about quantity, how many, but how strong, how Christian are our Christians. Um, the Bible talks about the judgment seat of Christ, that our work will be judged for what Sort it is, S-O-R-T. Not what size. I'm not saying that the amount of people and how many people you want, I'm not saying that isn't important. But I'm saying there's something to be said about a strong church. You can't have, listen, a, a, you can't have a strong church if you don't have a praying church. I mean, it's got to, it's got to, prayer means we're putting it on God. It's not like, hey, what we're going to do. You know, we can come in here and we can make, we can, we can make a lot of activity. We can do a lot of stuff without God. I mean, there's a lot of lost people out here making a lot of money, doing a whole lot of stuff, and, and, they're, not, and they're not dependent on God. But when it comes to a spiritual warfare, and a spiritual contest, and, and disputing with the devil and everything that goes into ministry, we, we need to be on our knees. We need to be praying. 
Look over at Acts chapter number 6. I was just looking at a little brochure a church had out that talked about their midweek service. This, this is not our midweek service. This is our prayer meeting. And we need to emphasize that. You say, well, what's the difference? Everything. We're not, we're not just here. We're not just here to get together. We're not just here because you're supposed to. But we're here. The main purpose of Thursday night is to have a prayer meeting. So in Acts chapter number 6, the, the, in those days, the number of the disciples was multiplied. There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were ne- neglected in daily ministration. Then the 12, let me just say this, our relationship with Spanish church has never been better. Let me say that again. I, I don't care if you're black, you're white, you're Asian, you're Spanish. We need to all get along, treat everybody the same, love everybody the same, and, and I believe that's happening. So they were neglected, or they at least believed they were ne- neglected, and the 12 called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, it's not reason we should have, uh, leave the word of God and serve tables Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, taking care of these tables, taking care of the widows, but we will notice, give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. They prioritized prayer. We, listen, we're not too good to go out and mow the lawn, but we can spend our time on better things. We need help doing the, mean, the menial things, the, the laborers things, and uh, we need to prioritize, and prayer needs to be our priority. It's the first one on the list, prayer and the Word of God. So number one, this church was a praying church. We need to be a praying church. Look back with me in Acts chapter number 2 and verse 22. And he says, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you've taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible he should be holding of it. So here Peter is preaching, and he's preaching to these men of Israel, and he talks about them crucifying the Lord, but crucified Lord didn't stay crucified. He rose from the dead. So he's preaching the, the uh, death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Over in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. So again, he's talking about the crucifixion, and he's talking about the Lord, he's talking about the Christ. So here we have a preaching church. And here we have, 2,000 years later, a preaching church. We still have the pulpit. We're not moving the pulpit. We're not taking away the pulpit. We still have the King James Bible. We still have the Word of God. And we're still preaching the Word of God. And I'm thankful for that. We don't pull any punches. We don't hold back. Uh, We're not interested in make everybody like it. And uh, go with me over to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Most preachers today that compromise, it's not what they say, it's what they don't say. It's not what, you, it's like, don't say anything controversial, uh, avoid doctrine, and I mean, this is the philosophy, this is what young men are being taught. Stay away from doctrine, because doctrine divides, and uh, you know, find out what people may want, and give them what they want, and make everybody happy. Well, that isn't Bible. That isn't what God said. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. I charge thee therefore, and notice this is the last chapter of Paul's last book. And, and these are, we could say these are his last instructions. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who should judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Just preach the book, preach the Bible. That's what it's about. Preach the word, don't stop preaching the word. And then he says this, be instant in season and out of season. So there's a time when people want preaching, there's a time when they don't want preaching. And this age that we're living in today, what a lot of people call post-Christian America, there's a lot of people who don't want to hear preaching. And, and we need to preach the word of God. Amen. Notice what he says next, reprove, rebuke, exhort. 
with all long suffering and doctrine. When you reprove and you rebuke, you're correcting people. You're, you're telling them, listen, you're, you reprove somebody, you're telling them you're wrong. The way you're living is wrong and you need to get it straight and live it right. And this is exactly what people don't want to hear. People don't want to be preached to. People don't want to hear preaching. They don't want to accept preaching. He says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. What does that mean? We, say, we use the expression, they want their ears tickled. They want their ears scratched. And I'm all for teaching. Thursday nights, I've been teaching. Uh, this is an exception tonight. I'm still hoping I'm teaching something. But we've been going like really into detail for people that are, are really want to learn some Bible. And, and, and I'm all for teaching, but not to replace preaching. If you go on the Christian radio station today, so-called, and, and I don't really listen to uh, Christian radio. I listen to Christian music, different things in different ways. But for every preaching program on the radio, there's going to be 50 teaching programs because they're going to give people what they want and they don't want preaching. We've still probably got Oliver B. Oliver B. Green out there somewhere. You may find Lester Roloff somewhere on the internet or something. But most of the modern, popular people today are all teachers, not preachers. So I'm not here to bash teaching. I'm all for, for learning and learning the Word of God and living the Word of God. Brother Charlie mentioned that I say this. Music, Christian music makes you feel good. Preaching makes you live good. We need preaching. So if people get upset because of the preaching, it's, it's, that's not the way to do it. Look back with me in Acts chapter number 2. And I'm almost finished. Acts chapter number 2. If I can find the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. And uh, look at verse 46. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. And they continuing daily in one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with singleness, with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Praising God. So here's a church where people praise the Lord. Uh, after the first night of the summit, my wife was back in this area somewhere, and uh, she said, you know, I was in an area there, and, and nobody lifted up their hand. And nobody said amen, and nobody said praise the Lord. And she says, I don't know if they liked it or not tonight. Well, I don't know if they liked it or not, to be honest with you. I don't know if everybody liked it. Maybe some of them didn't like it. But here's the thing. There's a lot of people just are not used to praising the Lord. When, when I had first gotten saved, we were in Calvary Baptist Church over in Kirkwood, which is the one I talked about selling the Koreans and pastoring for 15 years. I remember we had a guy come in one week, and he sat in the back on the right-hand side, and in the middle of the message, he said, amen. Everybody in the church turned around and looked at him. <laughs> you just didn't say amen over there. And nobody ever stood up. Nobody ever raised a hand. They would probably got thrown out of church. But here's what I'm saying. There's some people that just don't feel comfortable with that. They're just not used to it. Maybe you, maybe you, you know, maybe you don't raise your hand in church. Maybe... I can't help it. I mean, I, I can't help it. Uh, we, Brother Six talked about these verses, but look at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, and the Lord's coming in, and we call it the uh, uh, Palm Sunday or the triumphal entry. And uh, when he was come nigh, verse 37, even to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. And all the mighty works, for all the mighty works they had seen. This was spontaneous. This wasn't planned. It didn't say, you know, in the bullet and applause or, you know, lift your hand. It was, it was not orchestrated. It was just here he comes, the king. It's a picture of him coming into Jerusalem when he returns. And uh, they were saying, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, Notice they don't call him Lord. 
Rebuke thy disciples. Straighten them out. We, we want them to be as dead as we are. He answered and said, I tell you, if these should hold the peace, the stones would immediately cry out. I mean, they, listen, they, somebody just had to praise God. Somebody had to lift up their hands. Somebody had to stand up. Somebody had to be a Jay Gildersleeve in the choir. Now, let me just say this. Don't, don't be putting on a show. Don't try to draw attention to yourself. You know, there's some people somehow want to be the center of the attention. That's not, it's got to be from your heart. It's got to be real. But I, I enjoy praising the Lord. I'm not trying to push people into it. I'm not trying to, you know, we don't have a little electric seat here and gives you a shock and you jump up in the middle of the service. It's not like that. But it's okay to praise the Lord in church. And let me say this. If you praise the Lord in church, you ought to be able to praise the Lord outside of church. I mean, you ought to just, I was, I, Saturday night, I went to bed Saturday night, I guess it was Sunday morning. I just laying in bed clapping. I mean, I don't know if I ever did that before in my life, but I just had to clap. I was just thinking about the summit, some, some of the good high points of that, and I just was getting excited. So, don't just pray at prayer meeting, pray at home. Don't just praise God at a camp meeting or in church, but praise the Lord all the time. And then look back with me in Acts chapter 2, and, and we'll close. Acts chapter number 2. So this church, the New Testament church, the church in Acts, it's a praying church. It's a preaching church. It's a praising church. And then look at Acts chapter 2 and... Verse 37, uh, look at verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Look in chapter 4 and verse number 7. When he had set them in the midst, uh, they, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter Filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, uh, if we this day be examined of the good deed done uh, to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you and all uh, of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. Look over in chapter 5 and verse 14. Chapter number 5 and uh, verse, that's not the verse I want. Um, boy. Look at chapter 4 and they, verse 31. Chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they're assembled together. They're all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them believed were of one heart, one soul. Neither said to any of them that aught of the things uh, which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Great grace upon them all. Let me just say this. This was a powerful church. This is a powerful church. This, this is a... There's life in this church. This, this church is, is a living church. Um, there's spiritual activity. Something is going on. Now, you remember the Baalites up on Mount Carmel? They, they had a lot of action. They had a lot of noise. They had a lot of activity. But there was no fire. It, it, was, all, it was all man. It, it was all flesh. It wasn't, it wasn't God. This church at Pentecost... Listen, this, this life, this is God. This is, this is a church where, where people are getting saved. This is a church where people are growing. This is people a church where people are being baptized. This is where miracles are going on and, and wonders. And people are filled with the Holy Ghost. The, the power of God is there. And, and going back to my last Tuesday night's message, the power of God is where the presence of God is. If you want the power of God, I, I don't... I don't, I don't want to just ask God for his power. I, I want him. I, I, I use this for an illustration. If you didn't hear my message, 
I don't want my kids saying, give me your money, give me your money, give me your money all the time. I want my kids to want me, not just my money. So a lot of people pray for power, pray for power, pray for power. Before you pray for power, pray for God's presence, God's person, and pray for him and want him. But listen, these were the glory days of the church. There's no power like God's power. God was moving, church was growing, people being saved. There was conviction for sin, spirit filled. That's what we need in our church. We need God. We need God. So here's this church, and we're actually going into Acts chapter 3 now, uh, which is a miracle. God still does miracles. Um, but think about this. It's a praying church. We need to be a praying church. It's a preaching church. We need to preach the Word of God. We need to be Bible heavy. It's the Word of God that's quick and powerful. The Word of God changes lives. The longer I've preached, the older I've gotten, the more messages, the more I realize it's, it's the book. It's not how talented the, 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 the mailman is. It's, it's how powerful the Word of God is. It's a praying church. It's a praising church. It's a powerful church. We need our church to be everything that that church was. And Brother Charlie's going to come. We are the church. Remember that. If everybody in the church was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? Ask yourself that question. Don't be on somebody else's coattails. We are, each one of us are responsible to God. Each one of us are part of this church. And if we want the church what it's, to be what it's supposed to be, we better be what we're supposed to be.